The following content is provided by MIT OpenCourseWare under a Creative Commons license. Additional information about our license and MIT OpenCourseWare in general is available at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, good afternoon. I think these clocks may be a little bit fast, but we'll get started anyway. All right, so last week we moved the transition from thermodynamics and talking about delta G's and delta H in chemical equilibrium, started talking about K's. And we talked about Le Chatelier's principle of applying a stress to the system, that the stress system will respond in such a way to minimize that stress. So today we're going to start talking about acids and bases. And this is acid-base equilibrium. So we are continuing to talk about chemical equilibrium, but chemical equilibrium as applied to acids and bases. And acid-base equilibrium is of particular importance in biological systems because the pH at which a reaction occurs is very important in the body if the pH is not maintained. There are serious problems. A lot of enzymes use acid-base catalysis to catalyze their reactions. So these are, again, fundamental principles of biological systems and a direct application of chemical equilibrium. So today, uh, we'll continue with this. And we'll also, uh, throughout this part, go back and talk about how this relates to thermodynamics. So there'll be a little review uh, for the test on Wednesday, uh, somewhere in the middle of the lecture, where we go back and we're talking about how this relates to delta Gs. So are there any questions about the exam on Wednesday? Any technical things? So that'll be in the same place as last time. Instructions for the exam should be posted on the web, as well as extra problems. And all the TAs have special office hours. Uh, many of the TAs are handing back problem sets. So you might want to check with your TA before you uh, leave class today to see if your problem set uh, is available to help you review. And of course, there'll be a uh, recitation tomorrow, which we'll talk more about the exam on Wednesday. All right, so let's get started with acid-base equilibrium. And this is in chapter 10 of your book. And uh, there's a number of topics that we hope to get through today. So this is sort of all the introductory material to acids and bases. And it'll be the, the build up for what you need for the next uh, couple lectures. We have a few, uh, three lectures on this topic. So we start as sort of a new unit. The first thing we look at are definitions. And there are several different definitions of acids and bases. Some are more narrow to the ones that are really quite broad. So we're going to start with the most narrow definition and build our way up to the uh, broadest definition. So uh, in the most narrow definition, just considers an acid as any substance that, when dissolved in water, increases the concentration of hydrogen ions or um, also known as protons in solution. And a base is something that would increase the amount of hydroxide ion concentration when that base is put in water. So that's the narrowest uh, definition. We can go on and then uh, with the Bronsted Lowry acid and base, and this is what mostly we'll be using in this part of the course where an acid is defined as something that donates a hydrogen ion or a proton, and a base is something that can accept that hydrogen ion or proton. All right, so let's look at an example. So let's take something, CH3. COOH in aqueous solution, put it in liquid water, 
and there will be an equilibrium that's formed, arrows back and forth, that'll form H3O plus and CH3COO minus. Now, according to this uh, definition here, the acid is the substance that is donating the hydrogen ion or proton. So in this case, this would be the acid. It's donating this proton or hydrogen atom, ion, to a base. And this is the base. The base is doing the accepting. And when this base accepts the hydrogen ion, it forms this, which is its conjugate acid. And the original acid, when it loses the hydrogen ion, forms a base over here. And so these then are what is known as conjugate acid-base pairs. Conjugate acid-base pairs. So note that here, instead of forming H+, we're forming hydronium ion because that's more accurate as to what's actually happening in solution. So, hydronium ion. All right, so let's look at a little uh, movie that shows this happening where the hydrogen ion or the proton is given up by the acid and accepted by a base. So this uh, starts out, this little movie, these are just water molecules. In red is oxygen, and the hydrogens are in white. And the acid's going to come in in green, and it has hydrogen ions or protons on it. Here it's reacting with the water, and now you've formed hydronium ion, and now one water reacted with another, and you have a hydronium ion there. So once you've... Uh, once one water's accepted it, it can pass it along. So let's just look at that one more time. And you can see the interaction of that acid. So here water is acting as the base. It's accepting uh, that hydrogen ion, and it's now forming hydronium. All right, so this means that you have to have these conjugate acid-base pairs. When, when an acid donates its proton, it's going to form a conjugate base. When a base accepts a proton, it's going to form a conjugate acid. So the conjugate base of an acid is a base that's formed when the acid has donated its hydrogen ion. The conjugate acid of a base is the acid that forms after the base accepts the hydrogen ion. So these then, as indicated on the board, you have a conjugate pair here, the acid and its conjugate base, and here we have the base and its conjugate acid, another conjugate acid-base pair. Now let's look at two more examples and consider in these reactions which are the conjugate acid-base pairs, what's acting as the acid, what's acting as the base. So here we have a reaction of something with water, and it's forming hydronium ions and CO3 minus 2. All right, so is this acting as an acid or a base? It's acting as an acid, so it's giving up a hydrogen ion or proton to the water, which is acting as the base. And when it, gives, when it gives a proton to this, it forms the conjugate acid. So this is like the example we saw before. And what's left 
when you take the uh, proton or hydrogen ion off of this acid is the conjugate base over here. Now let's consider another example. Now if we take the same two things but write different products, Now, if this equation was presented to you, and you look at the products formed on the other side, and you're asked, is this acting now as an acid or a base, what would the answer be? It's, now it's acting as a base. So it's accepting a hydrogen ion from this water, which is acting as an acid. And when it acts as an acid and it gives up a hydrogen ion or proton, it forms this conjugate base. And when this molecule accepts an extra hydrogen, then it forms this conjugate acid over here. So you see that water can act as an acid or a base, and it'll do this uh, in, in a number of occasions. And that has a, a special name when that's possible. So you have to look at each equation to see what's going on. Always ask the question, what's donating the hydrogen ion or what's accepting, which will tell you whether it's acting in that particular example as an acid or a base. Several things can act as both. And so um, your amphoteric it can, molecule can function as either an acid or base depending on the conditions. And water is, is a good example of that. So finally, let's look at our third example, which we're actually going to not talk about too much in this unit, but come back to later in the course. But just so you have all the definitions up front, and after we go through this definition, we're going to go back and talk more about water. Water is very important in these acid-base uh, uh, equilibrium. So the final definition is uh, the Lewis acid and base. And here, it's more general because it's not even considering a hydrogen ion. So here, a base is de defined as a species that can donate lone pair electrons, and an acid is a species that accepts those electrons. So here could be an example of things acting as acids and Lewis acids and Lewis bases. So here, this base is a species that could donate lone pair electrons. And over here, you have something that could accept those lone pair electrons. So this is the most broad definition, because it doesn't even include a hydrogen ion. So we're going to come back to this later when we talk about uh, mechanisms of catalyzing reactions, uh, catalysts, because some catalyst acts as Lewis acids. So we come back to this later. But just so you know all of the, the various different definitions now. All right. So. Now we're going to go back to the sort of more uh, Bronsted-Lowry definitions when we talk about what is donating protons or hydrogen ions and what's accepting. So we saw that water has some fairly unique properties. And so if water can act as an acid or a base, water seems like it could react with water and do a reaction. This up here. So if you had water acting as an acid and water acting as a base, you could be forming a conjugate acid, hydronium ion, and also the conjugate base, hydroxide. So this raises the question then, if you have a glass of water, how much H2O are you going to have in that glass of water, and how much hy hydronium ion and how much hydroxide ion would be in, in water. So we can consider that how much water is in water. OK, so here's our equation again. And what we're really asking is what is K. So if we're at equilibrium conditions, we want to know how do the ratios ratio of products 
compare to reactants. So how much of these ionized species do you have? How much product over the liquid water? That's K. So how do we figure this out? How do we find, how do we find K for this particular reaction? Well, here are some of our, our uh, old familiar ways of relating terms uh, involving K. So we have delta G naught equals minus RT times the natural log of K. So if we know delta G naught, then we can find K at a particular temperature, knowing the gas constant. So we can uh, rearrange this expression here to uh, solve for K in terms of delta G naught. And we're going to do this at room temperature. And just a reminder, that's the gas constant. So first, we need delta G naught. So there's a couple of different ways one can calculate delta G naught. And uh, you might want to just sort of think in your head for a minute, what are those ways? because that's an important, useful thing to know on Wednesday. So this is one of the possible ways. If you know something about the delta G naught of formation of products minus reactants, what is the other equation that you might use to find delta G? Yeah, I heard it. So this one, that one should look familiar to you as well. Uh, this will be on, on Wednesday's, or this is material on Wednesday's exam. I haven't seen the exam, but that's certainly something you should, should look familiar to you for, for that exam. And it also shows the connection between the material that was covered on exam two and the material that we're doing now. So everything that, that you're learning for exam two will be uh, useful in the future. All right, so let's just calculate this one way. So, um, and I've done the math out here for you. So if we look up all of these values and we plug them in, we find that this delta G naught is plus 79.89 kilojoules per mole. So it's a fairly large positive number. So if we have a fairly large positive number for delta G naught, what do we predict about the size of K? Is it going to be a big number or a small number? It'll be a small number. And so you could actually calculate that from this equation or just sort of remember the relationship if you're just asked qualitatively if it should be large or small. But we can actually go through and calculate what K would be at room temperature. And the answer is 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14th at room temperature. And this number um, you'll see a lot in uh, the next, for, for quite, a, quite a while, in the next problem set in many, many lectures. That'll become a familiar number to you. All right, so that means this is a fairly small number. So that means that most of the water is actually H2O. A very small percentage of water is ionized at room temperature. So there isn't that much in terms of hydronium ion or hydroxide ions in your water. A small percentage of the water molecules are ionized or in this uh, charged form. So not much of this at equilibrium compared to this. Lots of water in a glass of water, one hopes. All right. So this equilibrium constant has a special name, which is uh, Y. It's going to become very familiar to you as, as the lectures go on. And this name is KW, W for water. So the equilibrium constant for water. And pretty much all of the acid base uh, things that we will be doing are at room temperature to make your life easier. So that's why it'll become particularly familiar. All right, so KW can be expressed in terms of the concentration of hydronium ions times hydroxide ions. And I just wanted to uh, make a point. I think you've, we've talked a little about this before, perhaps. But here, we're not including this bottom term. So we don't have the water down here. The KW is just equal to 
these two, not over the, uh, the two water molecules in liquid. And that's because if you have a material that's nearly pure, you don't include it in your equilibrium expressions. So if it's something in solvent, the concentration in water as the solvent is just not changing very much under these conditions. So we, it gets left out. So this is something that, that you'll see uh, many times. All right, so KW is the equilibrium constant, and it's the product of hydronium ion times hydroxide ion, and it's always going to be 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14th at uh, room temperature. So um, now we're going to look at definitions of pH and pOH and come back to this KW. So I think I'll do that over here. So pH, pH equals minus log of the hydronium ion concentration, and pOH, pOH equals minus log of the hydroxide ion concentration. We just saw that KW equals the hydronium ion concentration times the hydroxide ion concentration. So now if we take this expression and we put logs on both sides and minus signs on both sides, we can come up with the minus log of the KW minus log of hydronium ion concentration minus log of hydroxide ion concentration and find that pKW equals pH plus pOH and that's going to equal 14.00 at room temperature. So you see that there's a relationship between pKW, pH, and pOH that's derived from this equation from KW being equal to the hydroxide times the hydronium ion concentrations. And these are all useful things to remember in doing the problems because if you're, if you're given a pOH and asked for a pH at room temperature, you can use those equations to interconvert. It also turns out to be important in terms of thinking about the strengths of acids and bases. So let's look at strengths of acids and bases in terms of pH, the relationship between pH and acids and bases. So the pH of pure water should be 7, and that's neutral. 7 is neutral pH. An acid solution is anything less than pH of 7. A basic solution is anything greater than 7. And the EPA defines corrosive as substances that yield pHs lower than 3 or higher than 12.5. So here on uh, the pH scale over here, and on the other side it has hydronium ion concentrations. We're neutral in uh, the center here at 7. We're acidic anywhere below neutral, and we're corrosive below 3. And uh, we're basic above 7, and we start to get corrosive above 12.5. So now we're just going to look at the pH of a couple of different things to give you a sense of where they fit in uh, in terms of whether some of the things that you commonly use are acids or bases or corrosive. So. Um, what I'm going to do is ask for a couple of volunteers. We have some pH paper. Uh, this is not accurate to very many significant figures. 
uh, but you can dip it into the material and then look to see what pH it is by the color change. So um, here we have some glass cleaner, which is basically ammonia. And we also have some lemon juice. So we have a, a volunteer here who wants to measure pH. OK, thanks. We have soda, Dr. Pepper. And I'm not making, Dr. Pepper happens to be my favorite, so I'm not trying to uh, draw any bad conclusions for any particular soda product. Someone else want to measure a pH? <laughs> All right. All right. And I also got some tap water from MIT. <laughs> so uh, we have to get the pH paper back. Let's see, I can have trouble getting this open. Lemon juice? Yeah. MIT water. We need the ammonia too. Do you have a measurement over here? Three? And that was for the soda? Do you want someone want to do the ammonia in there? Do you want to pass pass that down? You can take that. Here, I can take this. What? Six for MIT water. Six for MIT water. What do we have for the ammonia? Okay, so this shows that it's safer to clean than it is to drink soda. <laughs> okay, so that gives you some general sense. Um, only lemon juice is really in the corrosive range, although soda is kind of right on the borderline. Um, and so the MIT water is, is uh, not not totally neutral, according to this. Now, we don't have a lot of significant figures in these measurements. And actually, a better way to measure pH, there are these pH electrodes, which we'll talk about later. But actually, measuring a lot of significant figures for pH doesn't work, even when you have uh, something better than the pH paper. And so if on any of your problem sets or tests, you seem to have a lot of significant figures for pH, it probably indicates that there's some problem there, because that would actually be highly unlikely that it could be measured that well. Uh, just so, just a little uh, tip for uh, proofreading your problems. So one reason why the water might not be neutral is that it may have some salt in it. And so we're going to be talking about problems of salt and water. And depending on what the salt is, it can give rise to a slightly acidic or slightly basic uh, pH of the water. So we're going to be uh, talking about that as, uh, as these lectures go on. So this gives you a little bit of a sense of the strengths of particular materials in terms of, of pH. OK. So let's do some definitions of acids and bases in, in water. All right, so first we're going to look at an acid in water. 
and we're going to be defining a new form of equilibrium constant. And then we're going to lead into talking about strengths of particular acids and bases. So here we have an acid in water situation. So we'll take our acid. And it's dissolved in water. And an acid dissolved in water, if it's an acid, it's going to be giving up its hydrogen ion to the water. So you're going to be forming hydronium ion. And you're going to be forming a conjugate base of that acid. So now if you're going to talk about the equilibrium of this reaction, which is a way of getting at the strength of the particular acid that's in water. We're going to be talking, if you're talking about an equilibrium constant, you're talking about a K. But here, we're going to talk about a special kind of K, which is a Ka, which is often called the acid ionization constant. which is just the equilibrium constant for an acid in water. So we'll have a lot of Ka's. And as you'll see in a few minutes, we're going to have some Kb's as well for a, a base reaction in water. So Ka, you're going to do it the same way you've done other equilibrium constants, products over reaction, reactants. So we have hydronium ion the conjugate base, which is a product, and over reactants. And here, with reactants, we're not including the liquid water, because that's the solvent, and it's not changing very much. Its concentration isn't changing much uh, during this equilibrium, so it gets left out of the expression. So this is the complete expression, then. And we could look up the value of Ka, or we could determine it if we were given concentrations at equilibrium. But a lot of these we can look up. And so this value is 7.6 times 10 to the minus 5 at, a, at a room temperature, which is pretty much where we're going to do all of these types of problems. So this is a fairly small, small Ka. And so what that's going to mean is that this acid, when put in water, is not going to ionize very much. It's not forming many of these products here. So this is a, this is a small number, not a lot of products, just a little, a little ionization, not too much ionization when this acid is put in water. So that's going to mean that it's a weak acid. So a weak acid is something that doesn't ionize very much when it's put in water. A strong acid is something that ionizes quite a bit. And so this acid in water is not going to make the pH all that low. Yes? Oh. Sorry, 1.76, yeah. Yeah, I just copied that down wrong. So it's still, either one is pretty small because of the 10 to the minus 5. That's really the thing you're going to be, you're going to be looking at, is what's over here uh, in terms of whether it's greater than 1 or less, greater than 1 or less than 1. So let's just give you that, that definition right now. So a strong acid is going to be something where the Ka is larger than 1. And weak is going to be less than 1. And almost all the acids we talk about are going to be weak acids. There are only a handful of strong acids. And this is even more true with bases. There's basically one strong base we're going to talk about, and everything else is kind of weak. So it has to be a very strong acid for this to be true, greater than 1. So you see down here, this is 10 to the minus 5. So that's a fairly weak acid. So let me just give you some generic ways that these acid and water problems will be written. So the way that we wrote this example on the board, we could write this as H in front of an A, where A stands for the acid, in water, 
is going to go to hydronium ion concentration and the conjugate base, which is indicated by the A minus. Now, you may also see this another way, and so I wanted to point this out now, that this BH plus could also be, can, is also an acid under these, the way that this expression is written. So here, it's giving up its hydrogen ion or proton to water, which is forming uh, the conjugate acid over here, and, um, and here, you're forming a base. So both of these uh, could be considered acids because they're both giving up their hydrogen ion to a base, forming a conjugate base. So over on the top, you have a neutral to negatively charged or plus to neutral on this side. And it can be written both ways. Often, the bottom one is indicating when you take the conjugate uh, acid of a base and put it in water. So uh, don't get confused if you see these written these different ways. And in any case, if you're talking about anything being a strong acid, you're wondering whether the Ka is bigger number than 1, uh, which means that pretty much you're ionizing completely. You're putting that acid in water, and it's going all the way. It's ionizing completely. It's forming as much hydronium ions as the amount of acid that you put in water. So it's ionizing completely. And a weak acid means that you're not ionizing that much. You're not forming that much hydronium ion when you put the acid in water. And you can also consider whether something's a strong acid uh, in terms of its pKa as well, not just its Ka. And you remember the uh, relationship here. So pKa equals minus log of Ka. And so we saw you know, with uh, the pKw before. So these are the, the same expressions. And so if you have a small value, less than 1 here, if this is small, you're going to have a higher value for pKa. And so the higher the value, the weaker the acid. So you can think about whether something's a weak acid in terms of its Ka or in terms of its pKa, depending on what information is given to you. And that's the relationship between those terms. So here are some examples of acids. And there's a bunch of these that will be in your book. So um, up here, we have the strong acids. And you can see these Ka numbers are enormous. They're very big. So you go pretty much all to product. You go all to hydronium ion concentration. So they ionize completely up here. And the ones you'll see the most are probably hydrochloric acid, uh, hydrobromic acid. Those would be the ones that you'll probably see uh, in problem sets in the book. And then we go from the strong acids down here weak. These are Ka's of less than 1. And so here you don't have nearly as much ionization. And of course, when these numbers get small, the pKa also gets uh, bigger. And we can keep going. There are a lot of acids. Uh, keep going down here to where you have really truly small Ka numbers and quite large pKa's. So these would be uh, very weak. Very, very little ionization when you put that, on, that acid into water. OK. Let's do the same thing for bases. OK. So let's look at a base in water. So let's take NH3 in water. The base will accept a hydrogen ion, forming NH4+. Plus, and the water becomes hydroxide. So when you have a base in water, you are going to form hydroxide. When you have an acid in water, you're going to be forming hydronium ions. So in this base in water, you're going to be talking about the base ionization constant, which is you'll be talking about Kb. And so Kb is going to be equal to the concentration of products 
at equilibrium over the concentration of reactants. Again, water is not included. It's our solvent in this case. And the Kb here is equal to 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5. So it's a fairly small number again at 25 degrees. So again, it's a fairly small number. So if you have a small Kb, then it's a weak base. You don't have much ionization to form the hydroxide ion concentration. So it's fairly weak if it doesn't ionize very much. If it has a small K, it means it doesn't ionize very much. So this would not give rise to a corrosive in the basic category because uh, you're not ionizing that much. You're not forming that much hydroxide ion. So we can do the same thing then for bases as we did for acids. And we can write generic equations. And you should get used to writing these equations. In fact, on exams, sometimes the, the molecules you're given as acids and bases are fairly long. And so if you want to just write it as a generic equation rather than considering the whole molecule, I will give you full credit for that if you write it correctly. Um, so it can be written in terms of the base B in water going to BH plus and hydroxide ion, base B in water. You could also talk about base A minus in water going to HA, the conjugate acid, and hydroxide. So a base in water should always give you hydroxide. Otherwise, you've written something incorrectly. All right, then how strong the base is depends on how much it ionizes to give the hydroxide ion. And so if you have a large number, it's a strong base. And really, the only strong base we're going to talk about in this class is when you actually add something like sodium hydroxide to your solution. That's very strong. That'll ionize completely. It already is a hydroxide ion. Um, you can also use the same equation. You can talk about uh, PKBs instead of PKAs. These are a little less common. Um, in biochemistry, organic chemistry, you're going to talk a lot about PKAs. You don't see PKBs that much. So most of the time, you just are going to convert them over to PKAs. Uh, but it has the same expression. And so um, these are, again, uh, inversely related. So if you have a large PKB, you have a weaker, a weaker base. And here are some examples of bases in, um, in the book. And there are a lot fewer of these that you actually work with. And so, uh, and there's none on this table that you would consider truly strong. So you have weak bases here that don't ionize very much. And they get a bit stronger down, down here. So what else is true about these is that there's a relationship between the conjugate acid and the conjugate base. So if you have a strong acid, its conjugate is going to be weak. If you have a strong base, its conjugate acid is going to be weak. So you're not going to have something that's strong and strong. That's just, that's just not possible. And I'll prove that in a few minutes. But if you, if you look at, at this table, if you have something that's like a strong, really strong acid here, HCl, then its conjugate is Cl minus. And that's ineffective as a base. It doesn't do, it doesn't do anything. So um, here, if you have really strong, you, basically its conjugate is worthless for anything. So um, then as you go down, if you're sort of moderately weak on one side, then you'll have very weak on the other side. You don't have to worry too much about this. If you just want to say it's going to be weak and it's going to be weak to make uh, things a little bit, bit easier, and if you have something that's a really strong base on this side, then its conjugate acid is also going to be completely ineffective as an acid. So when some, we're defining things as strong, is where they basically push the equilibrium all the way to the ions, and it's not going to come back the other way at all. So when it's strong, you're really talking about a reaction that's all the way driven to, to, form, to the ionized forms. OK. So now I'm going to um, 
prove to you that you can't have, they can't both be strong. There's chalk. All right, so let's look at an example. So if we have NH3 in water going to NH4 plus hydroxide ion, and I want to write an equilibrium constant for this, what am I writing, a Ka or a Kb? Is this a base in water or an acid in water? Base, and how did I know that? Because you're forming hydroxide ion, right. So this is a Kb, and so Kb is going to be equal to the products of the base in water over the reactant. And again, water isn't included. Now I'm going to write an equation for this guy, the conjugate acid of this base in water. And now I'm forming hydronium ions and the conjugate base. So here I have a base, the base in water, and here I have the conjugate acid in water. So now I'm talking about the Ka, which is going to be equal to the products, hydronium ion and NH3 over the reactant, which is NH4 plus. Again, water isn't included. And now if I'm going to take those two and multiply them together, the Ka's and the Kb's, and if I did that, if I multiplied Ka times Kb, then NH4 plus is going to drop out because it's on the top here and it's on the bottom here, and NH3 is going to drop out because it's on the top and the bottom, and we'll find that Ka times Kb is equal to hydroxide concentration times hydronium ion concentration. And what else is that equal to? Hydroxide ion concentration times hydronium ion concentration. Yeah, so that's equal to Kw. And we can write another expression here, which then is that pKa plus pKb is equal to pKw. And that's equal to 14.00 at 25 degrees. So there's a relationship between the conjugate acid and the conjugate base. They can't both be very large numbers. These guys have to add up. So that's a mathematical way to think about the fact either the equilibrium is going to lie in one direction or in the other direction. It can't be kind of going both directions to a large extent. These things all uh, come together and, and add up together. All right, so, oops. So just to, um, maybe I'll do, I can use this board right here. So just in terms of defining a strong, a strong acid, if you have the HA in water, then if it's strong, it's basically all going to the conjugate base and hydronium ion. There's really not much coming back here. It's very small or sort of non-existent. If this is strong, this is sort of ineffective. It's not pushing back this way. You're pretty much all going to your conjugate and if you have a strong base, strong base in water, it's again pretty much all going to that conjugate acid and hydroxide ion. There's really not much coming back in that direction. So we're going to assume for strong acids and strong bases that however much of this we're adding, we're creating pretty much the same exact amount of this and the same exact amount of that. All right, so we'll stop there for uh, today.
Good luck on Wednesday.